not a war between logic and emotion. Mm -hmm. It's it has to be that they are on the same team. We've been given two. Mm -hmm. Let's use both. If I change my thinking, I can affect my feeling. And then when I affect my feeling, I can affect my behaving. And then the behaving will affect my results. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of In the Clear where our goal is to help you get clarity on all aspects of your life, including a holistic approach that involves both logic and emotion. Today's episode is going to be on getting clarity on your place in people's lives. Are the people in your life helping you grow or are they contaminating you? Are they adding to your life or are they constantly taking away? So it's our hope with this episode that by the end, you'll say, I know who I need to keep in my life and I know who I need to limit or eliminate from my life. So this topic I think is very important because we often talk about the people who we need to stop investing in. Like mm -hmm. we talk about the energy we pour into others, but sometimes we forget about the energy that others are pouring into us. So I thought it was a good topic for us to cover. It's a great topic uh, because we have to be aware mm -hmm. of if, like you said, it is helping us grow or mm -hmm. if it's contaminating us. Mm -hmm. And I think that most of the time with, for example, media, mm -hmm. social media, we are being contaminated mm -hmm. if we're not being careful about the selection of who we are surrounding ourselves with. Mm -hmm. So it's a great topic because it affects us greatly. Yeah. Also, as much as it is important to know what's leaving you towards others, it's also really, really important to know what's being poured into you, what you are receiving. It's not just about what you're doing for others. It's also about what others are doing for you. Mm -hmm. So one example I think of, and this is something I experienced, there were certain groups of people who I thought were my friends or I thought had my back. But with time, I realized that I only fit a certain part in that group. Like I was a puzzle piece. And I think I was okay with that for a really long time because it meant I was part of something. It made me feel like, you know, that's the role I play in that group. Mm -hmm. So that group wouldn't exist the same way without me. You know, I'm unique in my own way. And with time, I realized that that was the only role I was accepted to take, that I was permitted to take, which was just to be the quiet one who listened to everybody's worries, who contributed any time that there was a birthday party and we mm -hmm. all wanted to buy, you know, a gift for someone. And then when it came to me, they didn't do any of that for me. Mm -hmm. So I was put in a place where I was always giving, but never considered and never receiving. Mm -hmm. So I was put in a place where I was always thinking of everyone around me. How do I make them happy? How do I make them feel special? But no one thought of making me feel special when there was an actual event in my life that, you know, that's just a granted thing. We should make her feel special. Mm -hmm. Like it's my birthday or I graduated or I wrote a book, you know. So I just reflected on that balance was there a balance between what i was giving and what i was receiving and there wasn't mm. it was it was a huge imbalance so when i decided to stop being part of that group in particular i remember feeling like so much guilt mm. and so much um like maybe i'm a bad person for expecting something from others maybe I'm asking for too much by expecting something in return. You know, mm -hmm. you give excuses to people. You say, what if they don't have something to give? And then that's my emotion, really, guilt and all of that. Then logic kicked in and said, but they do this for everyone else mm -hmm. except for you. So they have the ability. They're choosing not to. Mm -hmm. So I had to give myself that, you know, logic isn't my go-to. It's your go-to. My go-to is emotion. You're also very strong on the logic side, yeah. might I add. Mm -hmm. I, I think I am strong on the logic side, but my default yeah. is the emotion yeah. that overtakes me. Even if I'm thinking logically, sometimes I get really sad 
at a realization that logic brought me to, or I feel really weak, like I'm so aware of the truth, but I'm so taken by the emotion. Yeah. So when logic kicked in and said, they're doing this for everybody else, you are intentionally being excluded, I had to make the decision to no longer be part of that group because as long as I continued participating, now that I was aware that there was a huge imbalance between what I was offering and what I was being offered, mm. I felt like I was betraying myself mm. consciously by deciding to stay in that group. Like, what am I benefiting? And I know people say things like, you shouldn't always just think of yourself. You should, you know, if you think of yourself, that makes you selfish. Mm. So in a case like this, when thinking of yourself means that you are being an advocate for yourself, um, if it means that you are, you know, having your own back, if it means that you are raising your voice to say, I deserve this or this really hurt my feelings, then that's not being selfish. That's being considerate of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think every person needs to be considerate of themselves. So to whoever's listening or watching, if you find yourself in a situation where the moment that you start advocating for yourself and saying, I deserve the same things that I am giving. I deserve to be invested in the same way that I am investing. And you are met with language that makes you feel like you are being selfish, then those aren't people who have your best interest in mind. But here's the beauty of it. You are the one who should have your best interest in mind. So what is in your best interest in this situation that you're going through right now? Not sure what you think about this, Stefan. Well, I think there's a big difference between selfish mm -hmm. and self-care. Mm -hmm. And self-care is crucial. Yes. Right? And it doesn't mean that we're being selfish, but we are just reorganizing our priorities. Mm -hmm. We absolutely need to take care of ourselves first if we want to be able to take care of other folks later. Mm -hmm. And so self-care is great. And I also think that for you to realize, hey, you know what? This is not, not necessarily my crowd or not necessarily the right environment for me. Mm -hmm. They're not considering the whole puzzle. They're yes. just taking a piece of the puzzle, like you're mm -hmm. saying. Uh, that takes a bit more awareness about your self-image. Yes. And your self-image was healthy. If mm -hmm. it's not, if your self-worth is very low, you keep on hanging out with the wrong crowd. Yes. And you keep on just showing up with a little, being a little piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. instead of feeling confident that you can bring the whole puzzle. Yes. And um, self-worth is important for us to help us realize, hey, you know what? These folks are fine. I love them. We'll remain friends. But I need to start spending time with folks that will water me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the dead plants in a previous yeah. episode <laughs> and how sometimes we need to stop watering dead plants. Mm -hmm. uh, that's outward, but we also have to be aware of what's coming in inward. Yes. Because sometimes uh, it's not just about us not being accepted as the whole puzzle, just a little piece, but what's being poured onto us mm -hmm. is not always beneficial. Yes. Sometimes we get uh, contaminated yes. by people around us mm -hmm. and it becomes normal after a while we don't realize that we're being contaminated one quick example that i have uh, my son's 28 years old and mm -hmm. he travels quite a bit and a couple of weeks ago we we're both in montreal and i took him to have a pedicure at the nail salon <laughs> yeah. and so both him and i were sitting in the chairs yeah. and the ladies are taking care of our toes and our feet mm -hmm. and and, and as we walked in i had already been there uh, but it was his first time and as we walked in, the whiff, the smell of the nail polish remover mm -hmm. and the nail polish and all of those toxic products mm -hmm. was so strong because they had bad air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so it would take you aback because you're like, wow, this smells so strong. Mm -hmm. But after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes that your feet are getting done, mm -hmm. you no longer necessarily smell it. Yeah. And I asked my son, what's that smell? 
later on, as we're sitting side by side, and he says, wet smell. Yeah. That same smell that when we got in was so strong, you could no longer smell it. And so that's called normalizing. Mm-hmm. After some time, if we're not careful or we don't remain aware, mm-hmm. it starts being normal to just show up as a little piece of the puzzle. Yes. And so that contamination affects us even if we don't realize unless we remain aware. Yeah. I also think that being contaminated by what it is that people pour into you or mm-hmm. people offer you, not only is it contaminating you, but it's also stopping you from receiving other healthy input mm. from others. I see this with people who, for example, were in toxic relationships for a really long time. If you show them love in some way, it's it's just not getting through. It doesn't get through to them because they've been used to such toxicity mm. that love feels so awkward and different that they have no ability to receive it. Mm-hmm. Like give them a compliment and it's like you're talking to a wall and it's just, it makes me really sad because it just shows me what they're used to, what they've normalized mm-hmm. for so long. And love wasn't part of what they normalized. It mm-hmm. was the complete opposite. So it's that's, not- That's a good example of being contaminated mm-hmm. and conditioned over yeah. time. Because they used to be able to receive it. Yes. But I think that affects their self-worth and their mm-hmm. self-image. Because when you have a belief that you're not necessarily worthy of love, mm-hmm. if a person tells you you are so beautiful, mm-hmm. but if inside your belief is, you know what, I'm not that beautiful, it gets rejected by yes. your system. So it doesn't matter what they try to pour in, like you were saying, mm-hmm. if that's not your belief, yes. it gets rejected. There's mm-hmm. a conflict. Also, if part of your conditioning is to believe that love or anything positive could only come from certain sources, from certain people. And Mm. those people have trained you that all you're going to get from them is the negative, the toxic. Mm. If somebody other than those sources that you have been conditioned to believe, those are the only sources that I could receive love from. Mm. If someone else gives you love, you don't accept it because Mm. you're like, that's not the source I'm looking for. So if one of your beliefs about yourself is that you don't deserve love because the sources you've been depending on haven't given you love, then as long as they continue to give you toxicity, Mm. they are reinforcing that belief you have within that you don't deserve love. So it's just this toxic Mm. negative feedback loop. And for those listening, if anybody is going through this, the awareness of this dynamic is the most important thing. Because once you're aware, you can say, actually, I do deserve more than this. I do deserve love. I do deserve positive feedback. I do deserve compliments. Mm -hmm. I deserve, you know, someone believing in me. I deserve someone truly seeing me and hearing me. And so once you start putting out these messages into the world about the things that you know you want to believe about yourself or the things that you know are true about you, but you just haven't allowed them to shine, then you can start breaking the pattern of only accepting, you know, whatever you're receiving from particular sources. Mm -hmm. Then your mind can open up to different opportunities of different people and different places that you can be in that will nourish you in different ways. But if you're not aware, it's like you're walking with, you know, glasses that have one color and they block out certain things and they allow you to just see certain things. What did we refer to that last year? You're being blind, t- blinded. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That was your word. Being yeah. blinded. That was yeah. it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like you're blinding yourself to anything outside of what you've been used to. Mm-hmm. And what you've been used to is like 1% of what you can mm. get or can receive. So just be aware and say, I would like to open myself up to a little bit more. And one really helpful way that's you know changed my life, I would say, because I had such a hard time for so long in building my self-worth and my self-esteem on my own, I kind of had to imagine stepping outside of myself mm. and looking at myself as someone I love And then I would say, 
what would I give to someone I love? How would I speak to someone I love? Mm -hmm. And it's really sad because I did have to step outside of myself to be able to feel bad for myself mm -hmm. and feel that empathy that I really needed because I was really hard on myself. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps whoever's listening or watching as well is imagine stepping outside of yourself and look at yourself as someone you love. What would you change? Mm. What people around you would you cut off out of your life? What environments, let's say, you know, you belong to a certain community where there are certain cultural beliefs or religious beliefs, which of those environments would you remove yourself from? Mm. Or would you decide that you no longer want the conditioning that they've thrown on you for so long to affect your life. Mm. Reflect on all of that. What would you tell someone you love to continue exposing themselves to, to continue receiving from, and what would you tell them to do the complete opposite? Mm. Yeah. You have to redefine your beliefs, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to groups, organizations, mm -hmm. or religion. Yeah. Uh, these are beliefs that we have inherited when mm -hmm. we were born. Some of us have been told things when we were two years old, five years old, six years old. And one thing that's helped me over time is realize that beliefs are decisions. So it doesn't matter who they come from, really they are decisions. We decide to believe this, which means it's optional, we can change it at any time. And decisions are rules that we set for ourselves. And so at some point I realized that I could change the rules. Now, I'm not saying to anyone to go and disobey the rules mm -hmm. in your country, on your city, uh, but the personal rules that we set for ourselves can be changed. Mm -hmm. And when we realize that these beliefs, even if they've been told to us 2000 times again and again, mm -hmm. while chanting, while whatever, we at some point need to make a decision and mm -hmm. say, hey, does this belief really belong to me? Mm -hmm. Or was it lent or passed down to me? And if mm -hmm. so, am I okay with this belief? Mm -hmm. And often these beliefs are great for us as kids, possibly, but later on in life, too often old beliefs that are obsolete still keep on affecting what we are doing today. Mm -hmm. And it comes back again to self-image, self-esteem, self-worth, knowing exactly what you're worth to decide what's best for you to mm -hmm. move forward. Yeah. And that's what I call being in the or operating from a clear state. Yeah. Sometimes we are in a foggy state. We are in a chaos state. Mm -hmm. Operating from a clear state is knowing who you are, what you stand for, what you want, what you're going after. And most importantly, who should stick around you? Mm -hmm. Because you can never outperform your environment. And when we talk about being poured water onto by our friends, possibly sometimes uh, being contaminated, well, at some point, we need to take responsibility for our environment. Because mm -hmm. it's easy for us by default to say yes, but it's because of the circumstances, the people, the environment, where I'm at. But at some point, I think we need to take responsibility for the power of being able to sometimes slowly change, modify, or adapt our environment. You said something really powerful. You can never outperform your environment. That is so powerful to me because mm. for the longest time I thought if I know who I am and if I know my powers and my strengths and my weaknesses and vulnerabilities, then I can outperform mm. anything as long as I know myself and I know who I am. And with time, I realized that if I really know who I am, and if I really know what my value is, continuing to stay in an environment that's constantly beating me down shows that I don't believe that my knowledge of who I am and my knowledge of my value and my self-worth is worthy of being advocated for or is worthy of being in better places. Because you can be the strongest person on the planet mm. If you have someone chipping away at you or at your self-esteem constantly, you're going to break down bit by bit. Absolutely. Like think of using a chisel to, you know, break something down. Mm. The first few times that you go like this, you know, nothing's going to change. Mm. But at one point it reaches that weak point yeah. and the whole thing falls apart or yeah. you break off a piece. So I really love that. You can never outperform your environment. Mm. So... 
if one, we were... one visual, if I may, yeah. that I've used quite a bit with both of my kids to illustrate the environment and the power of the environment is it's kind of like if you had a helium balloon mm -hmm. that goes up, that's you, mm -hmm. but you're stuck in an elevator that's going down. Mm. You can push and push <laughs> yeah. against the ceiling. You know what I mean? That's true. But wow, you're still yeah. going to go down. Yeah. So your environment matters. Absolutely. Yes. I love that so much. If we were to turn it into something, into the complete opposite, what kind of an impact do you think or what statement could we come up with for a positive environment? A positive environment. Something that empowers you. Something that empowers you. That Let's helps say you you're grow. feeling really small, you're yeah. not feeling. Do you think that being in an environment that builds you up can have the same Absolutely. positive impact that the a negative environment Absolutely. has? Absolutely. So we could reverse it with the balloon, mm -hmm. which popped, but now is in an elevator that's going up, it's right? Going you know what I mean? Yeah. Even <laughs> if the balloon is flat and yeah. it popped, it's still going to go up True. if you're surrounded by the right environment. Mm -hmm. And I've used that in my life through books. Mm -hmm. through seminars when I was younger, early 20s. Uh, if I couldn't find people immediately around me that were a positive environment, mm -hmm. I'd go out, parasocial impact, find the people that I saw were already where I wanted to be and listen to them and look at them and study them and research them yeah. so that it would impact first how I think. Um, we experience all of life through our thoughts, mm -hmm. all of it. So if we do not change the way we think it doesn't matter what we change outside the environment or not it's not going to really change mm -hmm. right so that's where it's, it yeah. starts for me i'm going to challenge you on that because okay. you said we experience all of life through our thoughts i Here personally comes the believe that. <laughs> no it's the truth you know we've talked about this a million yeah. times yeah i personally believe that we experience all of life through our emotions mm. through our bodies Yes, that gives birth to thoughts. Yes, that gives birth to beliefs and, you know, value systems and all of that. Mm -hmm. But I truly believe that, I, and I know this for a fact, that everything we go through registers somewhere inside of us. Mm -hmm. It registers somewhere in our body. And so when I went to somatic healing, mm -hmm. which is therapy, but you're tuning into your body, what mm. is it telling you about a certain experience that you went through? Um, for example, let's say uh, someone abandoned you when you were really young. Mm. Let's say it was a parent or um, someone that you really cared about. Yes. Yeah, yeah true. Um, and let's say you were super young. You were three, four, five. What is the message that you are receiving at that point? That you're not worthy. That you're not worthy. Yeah. Do you, as a three, four, five, six, even 10, 12 year old, have the ability or the capacity or the language to tell yourself, it's not true that you are not worthy of someone staying? You, you don't. do not. No, absolutely not. You just register that as it happened. Yeah. And then the response that your body registered in that moment could have been that you froze up, mm. that you went back into the fetal position, which is very protective, that mm. you you just, you didn't know how to process it with words and your body processed it in a way where now every time in your life you go through an experience where someone abandons you, even as an adult, you're going to go back to that same response mm. because that response was trapped somewhere in your body and was never given the opportunity to be released mm. in a healthy way. Also, another example, kids who go through relationships. Yes. Can I just add yeah, to? Of course. Um, I do not disagree with going through feelings and emotions. Yeah. Uh, I think you're quite right. Mm -hmm. What I've come to understand later on in life, just mm -hmm. to reuse the example of a child being abandoned, which happened to me. My dad left when I was two years old. Mm -hmm. He used to beat my mom. He'd beat me and he was sent to jail and I lost all contact mm -hmm. with him. And for some time, like you were saying, as a two-year-old, four-year-old, seven, eight, ten-year-old, I had the feeling that I wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. that he didn't necessarily care about me, not because he didn't care, but because... 
I wasn't worth caring for necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling a lot of very negative and painful emotions. Mm -hmm. But later on in life, what I've realized is that you can go and relabel those feelings and those thoughts. And, and what I've come to realize also is that emotions and feelings for me always come after the thinking. And so I see the sequence as logic first will impact how I feel. Mm. And so if, for example, I'm not feeling right, I know that it's because I'm not thinking right. And if I change my thinking, I will by default change how I feel. So what I did with regards to my situation as a kid, I used to label it as a negative situation. Growing up, I've learned a little bit more about compassion, forgiveness, mm -hmm. also taking responsibility. The title of my book is 100% Responsible mm -hmm. about how I think, how I feel, what I say and what I do. And at some point, I kind of flipped the narrative and thought, yes, my dad did what he did, but that belongs to him. Now it's my choice to label it the way that it will empower me. Mm -hmm. And by flipping the script, changing it with my logic and my thoughts, I started feeling differently about mm -hmm. my dad, about my childhood. Mm -hmm. And what that did is that it triggered a new mindset, which is before I had what I call a victim mindset, things happened to me. Circumstances, people, everything had a huge impact on how I behaved. But then when I flipped the script, I started being in power and saying, okay, well, circumstances and the people are one thing, mm -hmm. but I still own me, how I think, what I do and how I feel. And so, of course, we all feel a lot. And so in order for me to perform well, for example, be it at work, be it with my kids, with my wife in day to day life, I've learned that first your thinking affects how you feel and then your feelings affects how you behave. Mm -hmm. And if I want to change the behavior, of course, the behavior affects the result. So mm -hmm. if I want to change the behavior, the result, the result being the effect does not make the source or mm -hmm. the cause, the circumstances. To me, the cause is your thinking. Change your thinking, no matter what the condition or the circumstances, you'll change how you feel and then you'll change how you behave. Mm -hmm. That has served me so much. Mm -hmm. While I keep on learning from you <laughs> also how yeah. to feel more. Yeah. And, and one last thing about the feeling. Do you remember when I had just received my first, the first copy of my book? Yeah. At 100% <laughs> yes, Responsible. I and yeah. I sent you in WhatsApp or text, I sent yeah. you a picture and I said, hey, it's so cool. I just received the first book mm -hmm. ever. Finally, I have a book in English because my book was in French before. Yeah. And what you uh, answered me was, <laughs> wow. How does that feel? Yeah. And it was like, what? Like, how and does that? I didn't that... think anything of no, it. I'm like, that's because, what like I Because like you said, normally that's ask. your default. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. my default is thinking and logic. And it took me aback and I was like, what does that mean? How does that feel? Yeah. I actually told my <laughs> wife about it. And I said, Nashua, ask me, how does that feel? I mean, yeah. what am I supposed to answer to that? Because to me, it's like, well, what do you think about receiving your first book? Or what do you think that's going to mean? Like mm -hmm. To me, it's like thinking, yeah. logic. To you, your default My was, default how does that feel? Emotion. And so I had to sit down and, and yeah. I had to sit down and think about feeling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And then I was like, hey, well, what kind of emotion could I tie to this experience here? Yeah. And I probably took my wheel of emotion out to try to pin one and find one mm -hmm. um, because my default is always your thinking changes yeah. your feelings. I'm the complete opposite. So for me, the emotion comes before mm. the logic. So I have to ask myself, how are you feeling about this? And then I can speak to myself with logic to, to challenge whether the feeling is based on what others have taught me or the way they tried to make me feel or is it based on the truth mm. I'll give you an example so let's say I'm in a situation where I just felt rejected I have to go into my body before I can say this is not personal it's not about you it doesn't mean anything about you um, this person rejecting you um, you know let's say they're rejecting me for affection or they're rejecting me for the prospect of a relationship or anything mm -hmm. I, I I 
can't do that. I can't go to the logic right away. I have to go into my body and say, how does this rejection feel? Because you know what happens to me? I freeze. Mm -hmm. I can't think properly. My whole body goes into shutdown and I feel like I'm sinking into the seat that I'm sitting in. Mm -hmm. And so when I ask myself, when I go inward and say, how are you feeling? Do you feel any tension in your body? And the first thing I notice is my hands go into fists mm. and my arms go very close into me. And sometimes my knees are up to my chest and I'm holding myself like this and I feel heavy. I feel tension in my arms like they're so stiff. Mm. So when I'm tuning into what my body is feeling and I start moving my body in different ways. So let's say my arms are up to my chest and I'm in combat mode and I'm protecting myself and I start moving my arms. I'm telling my body, you don't have to be stuck in this response. And then I can say, why are you feeling mm. this way? Where is this coming from? Is there a story from your childhood that this reminds you of? Is this a pattern in your life where every time someone rejects you, you feel this exact same way? Mm. You go to that default of freezing. Some people go into the default of another trauma response, which is called fawning. Mm. So instead of you know, them spending time with themselves shutting down completely, they might start trying to please the other person more. They might try harder because they don't want to face the truth of what just happened. Mm. They try so hard to change it by changing that person's opinion mm. or by changing their mind. Like if I can get you to not reject me, then I can change the belief about myself that mm. I deserve to be rejected. Mm. So for me, my response is freezing. For some people, it's flight. So they just completely shut down. They want nothing to do with you. They mm. will not talk to you anymore. They don't know how to process their emotions by leaning in to the person that they're with. They want to run away. Mm. They want to end the relationship. They want to end communication. They run away. So every person has a certain default or multiple defaults. Mm. So once I know exactly what that feels like in my body and I show my body that there is a way to break out of this, whether it's by... Like I said, moving my arms, me in particular, getting up and going for a walk, moving my body in a way, taking deep breaths. Mm. You taught me box breathing mm. um, a long time ago, a few years ago. So for those who don't know what it is, you just you can say you want to breathe in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds and then release for four seconds. And mm. you do that. That resets your nervous system. Mm. It really helps you. So when you do that, then you've told your body, hey, I'm here for you. I know what's going on. I'm not leaving you to allow someone else to tell you how to feel or how mm. to think of yourself. And then I can say to myself, what this person did is based on who they are, not based on who I am. So this is where my logic begins to kick in. This mm. is where the truth begins to kick in. And now I can affirm my body like you mm. are safe. You don't have to respond or react this way every single time a rejection is aimed at you. There's another way. There's a way to say, I'm, I'm here for you. We can get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. We can get into another relationship where we aren't constantly rejected. So for me, it always starts with the feeling. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the logic. So they help each other. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed Absolutely. to logic. I'm no. a very logical thinker. You are. But for me, the first, remember in another episode, we talked about how sometimes one door opens and then there's other doors behind it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, open that first door the other ones you won't have access to Absolutely. for me the first door is the feeling yeah. it's the emotion and yeah. then logic comes yeah. after that it's interesting how yeah. we have different mechanisms or different defaults mm -hmm. and i think what's important to remember for those of you listening or watching is that it's okay to be a feeler first mm -hmm. and it's okay to be a thinker first mm -hmm. what's important is to know who you are yes are you on default mode, thinking first. My default when I was younger was think first, feel never. Ooh. 
as an adult, think first, feel never. That's right. As an yeah. adult, I've worked on that feeling muscle, and I started feeling more. So now it's think first, feel later. Mm -hmm. But whichever default you default to, either you think first or you feel mm -hmm. first, it's important to know yourself. Yeah. None of them are wrong. Both of them are good. What's best for you? Yes. It's interesting to hear you speak because your default, I've known you for a few years, mm -hmm. and it is for sure feeling, which yes. is a great thing. And, and part of why I had become, as a kid, think first, feel never, is because feeling was very, very painful yes. for some time. And I think I developed that mechanism unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, one traumatic example that I sat through, literally sat through, was being in the car with my mom when I was seven. She was 28. We were parked. We're about to leave the parking lot. Uh, I'm in the passenger seat. She's about to drive away from the parking when she stopped talking. Oh. I asked a few questions, no answers. I realized mm -hmm. something's wrong. Um, no answer. So I thought, well, I'm going to go out and get some help. I don't know what's happening. And as soon as I opened the door, she, with her left hand, grabbed my arm, squeezed me. And looking back at her, uh -huh. I realized that she also had no idea what was happening to her. She was panicking. So I decided to stay in the car and I started honking repeatedly until people showed up. Mm -hmm. Eventually people arrived. Then the ambulance arrived. I had no idea what was going to happen to my mom, but she left in an ambulance, remained in a coma for a few weeks. And every single night as a seven-year-old, as I would wait to see what was going to happen to her, mm -hmm. I would cry myself to sleep. Aww while praying, just so that she would survive. Mm. And she did survive, but the first thing that we realized when she came back to her senses is that she no longer had any idea of who I was. Mm. Her only son, I don't have any brothers and sisters. My dad had left, was in jail since I was two years old. And so to me, she mattered a lot. Mm -hmm. And now she had no clue of who I was. Yeah. Well, what we realized is that she had suffered a stroke and a very severe stroke that left her completely paralyzed on the right side for life. When I say completely paralyzed, we could have taken a lighter, burned her ear, her toes. Wow. She couldn't feel a thing. But on top of that, the stroke caused her to suffer from aphasia, mm -hmm. which meant that she could no longer read, write, and speak at the age of 28 years old. So going through this and living this and everything that it meant after Part of that was loss of income. We had to move into low income housing. We had to depend on welfare and social assistance. All of my childhood, it was not fun and mm -hmm. it was very painful. And when I would feel some of these emotions, I kind of uncon unconsciously learned to shut it down. Mm. And when trauma happened or, or strong experiences like this happened, my default became, you need to figure things out. You need to think your way out of this situation, make something out of it, but it's not time to feel right now. Yes. You will feel later. Back then it was feel never because it was so painful. Mm -hmm. Eventually I learned that, hey, you know what? Feeling is great, but you kind of need to pace yourself, engage it. And I kind of developed or learned unknowingly that if I change my thinking, I can affect my feeling. And then when I affect my feeling, I can affect my behaving. And then the behaving will affect my results. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to have positive results, to me, it started with thinking. But today I understand the value of feeling all of life because mm -hmm. otherwise we're missing the track, in yes. my opinion. So really going to thinking right away, going to logic right away was a trauma response for mm -hmm. you. It was, it was a reflex. Either flight you're running away from the situation yeah. or freeze absolutely just you... the, the thinking part for me as well i'm on the spectrum of autism is that how you call it yeah uh, with ashberger my son and i both of us are very very thinkers logic and i had to kind of teach myself to feel more over time yeah but i had to learn and yeah. think <laughs> how do you feel you know what i mean yeah. like for you you just feel you just feel and, and it's natural. Yeah. And then you think about how you're feeling. To me, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, what's feeling? Okay, that's how you feel. Yeah. Like I feel before I make a decision mm -hmm. that I'm going to feel. Mm -hmm. One time I was driving to my accountant's office and I'm, I've told you this story before. And on the opposite side of the road, so the incoming traffic, I see a man on a bike fall over. 
and I could see his face was full mm. of blood. And there was like a divider in the middle. So there was no way for me to turn around and see what was going on or help him. But the moment I saw him, my heart just sunk and I started shaking and I could not stop. By the time I made it to my accountant's office, he was like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I saw this guy on the road and, you know, he has blood all over him and there were people trying to help. I can't like mm. stop feeling like I need to help him. That's how potent mm. <laughs> the feeling aspect of me is. It, it's not something it I can decide. You. I actually yeah. have to decide I need to stop at this mm. point or I need to tune into my body and see what's going on. Why is this feeling so strong? Why do I have this big urge mm. to help someone? And sometimes people book sessions with me. And um, there was this one guy who, after a couple of sessions of us talking, he also had the pattern of constantly needing to save people, mm. like whether it's his family or, and he was a medical doctor. Um, in the army. So that was literally his job. Mm. And at the end of, I think it was our second or third session together, he said to me, oh my God, I just feel like my body was like this big balloon of water and it just burst. Like wow. now I feel like I can breathe. He said, yeah. I have to save people because if I don't, people die. Yeah. I just got goosebumps all over my body yeah. because he had this urge to help even somebody that he saw fall on the side of the road or someone in his family who he saw was crying mm -hmm. and is going through crisis because that internal belief he had based on his experience was if I don't save people, people die. Mm -hmm. So he had that fear that maybe he's gonna cause something like that, even though on a logical level, he knows if if I don't help her while she's crying, she's not gonna die. Mm. But his body has been trained mm. to save people from dying, to work that hard, mm. because if he doesn't work that hard and if he's not always on edge and watching out for the well-being of everyone, people die. Mm. So I challenge people who are listening to look at the patterns that they have. If it is the feeling that they go to first, explore that. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? What is it registered like in your body? What does it feel like? And if it is the logic that they go to first, also explore that. Ask yourself, why am I stopping myself from feeling? Mm. What stories happened in my life? that told me if you feel it's going to be so painful mm -hmm. so stop and as you were talking about the conditioning from your younger years mm -hmm. like think first feel never mm -hmm. i think many people were trained to be that way i was trained to be that way my dad is like a big philosopher mm -hmm. he loves history he's a very logical thinker so i grew up in an environment that said think first also feel never mm. or maybe you can feel on paper when you write poetry or when you listen to a song but you don't bring feelings out here mm -hmm. and i think it's also because of the way that my dad was raised i don't think it's a negative thing thing about him i think people listening will be able to recognize that the older generations were very led by logic and very afraid of emotion without knowing why. Mm. So I was trained to think first and feel never, now that you've put words to it, but I always felt first mm. and I hid the feeling because I thought if I felt it meant something was wrong with me, I was too sensitive mm. or what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? Why is she having a panic attack? Why is she crying so much? Why is she so stressed out that she has three exams in 24 hours? Mm. Um, I'm stressed out because it's stressful. I'm anxious because it's anxiety inducing. I'm feeling because I'm human. I'm sensitive because I'm human, mm. because I feel things deeply. And so I always felt like something was wrong with me because the feeling was so strong. And I'm like, I can't control it. There isn't a moment that comes where I say I'm deciding to feel. Mm. No, I'm feeling. And then I need to decide to mm. no longer feel. So in a previous episode, you and I talked about 
what is it that got me to accept myself fully? And and when I came to a point of complete self-acceptance of myself or complete commitment to continue to accept myself and continue on that journey, I realized that my defaults weren't things that made me wrong mm. or a mistake. Those were just parts of who I am and they are parts that need my compassion, my understanding. My sensitivity is a part of me that needs to be embraced by me, mm. not a part of me that needs to be shut down or told, you stop right there because we're only welcoming logic mm. here. So I had to make the decision alongside accepting myself to accept every part of me and not shut it out. There's a book called No Bad Parts, and mm. it talks about all the parts that we have, the good, the bad, the parts that we shut out or shut down. And when you shut out a part of you, it's like you're putting it in exile. Mm. You're shaming it. You're saying, I don't want to recognize you. I don't want to say that you are part of me. So let's say with my sensitivity, for the longest time, I exiled my mm. sensitivity. I think of the Lion King and what they did to Scar, like mm. he was exiled, you yeah. know? You are you cannot come past these limits. I did that to my sensitivity. Does it mean that it went away? No. no. It means that it was just always waiting for me to let it back in. And I always felt like that was a part of me that if I showed it, that it gave people permission to take advantage of me or it gave people permission to look at me and say, you're so sensitive, like calm down. And so I had to embrace that part. Yeah. And very recently, this would have been a few months ago, I was having a conversation with my sister and she said to me, I was, I was crying, like I was a mess. I was having a mental health week where mm -hmm. all I needed to do was just let it all out. And so my sister came over and she was like, you're a very sensitive person. And I, I was ready to fight and be like, I know I'm sensitive and I'm proud of that. It's just part of who I am. But she went on to say, that's what makes you who you are. Mm -hmm. That's what allows you to write as beautifully as you do. I can't write that way. I'm not like you. I don't have that same level of sensitivity that you do. So I mm. think that's beautiful. She said, but I think it will serve you to shut it off in real life. Mm. Let it shine when you're writing because it makes your writing beautiful. It helps you understand others, but learn to shut it down. Learn to let your logic, she didn't use these words mm. exactly, but learn to let your logic lead instead of that sensitivity leading because the world is a tough place. Mm. And I just, that really hit me hard that sometimes you can be selective with who it is that you show certain parts of you to. So it's not that you're exiling those mm -hmm. parts and saying, you are not part of me. You're saying, I'm going to make sure that when I show you to others, that they are willing to take care of you and see you and hear you and not belittle you. Mm -hmm. So again... Are the people in your life honoring every part of you and helping every part of you grow and feel respected? Are they treating the parts of you that are tender, that need care with the care that they need? Or are they contaminating you and looking at those parts and saying, you're too much. Yeah. You're wrong. You make her you know, someone that we don't like. So reflect on how the people around you make you feel about the integral parts of who you are. Because a lot of times we shut parts of ourselves, not only because we feel ashamed of them, but because we know that those around us will never accept mm. those parts. And so we change ourselves so that others could view us differently. And I always ask this question, if someone only loves you or respects you, because we're not just talking about relationships, we're think of your career, whatever you're going through in your life right now. If the people around you are only loving you or respecting you or uh, connected to you because of the show that you put on, 
because of the ways you pretend to be when you really are not that way, then are they really respecting you? Are they really loving you? Are they really valuing you? Or are they loving, respecting, and valuing the person you are pretending to be? Mm -hmm. So if that's directed towards who you're pretending to be, then are you really receiving that love and respect and value? No. Mm -hmm. It's a... It's a What's the word? It's an illusion. It's not real. It's not directed at you. So stop putting your energy into getting the validation of others and put your energy into being yourself. And if someone around you doesn't respect that, then you say, okay, I only need my own validation. And mm -hmm. my validation tells me that as long as I am being myself and being true to myself and honoring every part of me, then people who don't validate me for that don't belong in my life. Period. Yeah. The end. The end. It, it takes uh, <laughs> self-acceptance. Close the book and start a new one, you know? That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Or, or, or start a new environment. Yes. Uh, but it takes self-acceptance, mm -hmm. self-worth to understand that all of you is okay. Yes. There are no bad parts. Mm -hmm. And once you start accepting yourself, then it's going to be easier for the other folks to accept all of you as well. So I think that sometimes it's a bit of a reflection. If you're not really taken in as the whole puzzle, the question could be, are you taking yourself in as the whole puzzle? Or are you also playing small sometimes or just showing a piece of the puzzle? It goes both ways. Mm -hmm. The environment could shut you down and just take a piece of the puzzle. But sometimes are you presenting just a piece of the puzzle or are you showing all of you? And when you are healthy with your self-image, you do not fear showing all of you. Because mm -hmm. you no longer feel, like you were saying, like some parts are not necessarily okay to show, you become okay with being sensitive. Mm -hmm. Instead of going on the defense and say, yeah, I know I'm sensitive. It's like, hey, hey, you know what? No, that's one of your superpowers mm -hmm. and embrace it. And mm -hmm. once we start embracing it, then we don't fear showing the whole puzzle. So I think that one of the key messages for our friends listening and watching mm. is that it's okay to be feeler first. Mm -hmm. and thinker later, not never, thinker yeah. later. It's <laughs> yeah. also okay to be thinker first, feeler later. Mm -hmm. Whichever default mode you're on, it's fine. Mm -hmm. There are no bad parts. Yes. And once you start embracing yourself fully, all of the parts, it'll be easier for folks around you to start embracing all of you as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Also, be aware of the power that the balance between mm. feeling and thinking brings into your life. Because, like I said, sometimes the feelings that you feel are coming from a place of allowing the truths of other people to seep into yours. Mm. And so when you allow yourself to become aware of all those truths that you've been allowing to affect you, you can ask yourself, what is my truth? Mm. And that's where the logic comes in. I am worthy. I am okay. I am enough. I don't deserve to be treated this way. All of that is your truth. And mm. when you bring that to the feeling that you're feeling, then you're telling it, we have the ability to not feel this way mm. all the time. There are different positive feelings that we can have. And there are different positive places we can be in and positive people who we can mm. invite into our life. So be aware of the power that having both logic and emotion work together mm -hmm. could bring into your life. Try not to, I mean, I hear this all the time in the business world, like there's no room for emotion mm. in the real world or there's no room for emotion for winners or no I mean, if you say that, then you are fooling yourself into believing that you don't feel. You can shut down your feelings, but they're there. Mm. And you'll know that they're there because the littlest situation that triggers you in some way, you either blow up or you say something you don't mean or you ghost people mm. or you don't communicate properly. And where do you think that's coming from? Pent up emotions. Yeah. So 
it doesn't make you a superhero to only think. Okay. And it doesn't make you a superhero to only feel. Mm -hmm. It makes you a superhero to be able to marry the two mm -hmm. and use them together. In, and they are on one team. They are not opposing teams. Mm -hmm. And I think I really learned that from our conversations together is that it's, it's not a war between logic and emotion. Mm -hmm. it's, it has to be that they are on the same team. I've yeah. realized that they are two engines. Mm. We've been given two engines. We could run on one. Yeah. Uh, but we've been given two. Mm -hmm. Let's use both. Yes. And if you were on your canoe, for example, and you had a paddle, well, if you just use one all the time, where are you going to go? You're going to go in circle exactly. all the time. Right? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> a really and, you know, powerful <laughs> yeah. and so you want to use both. Yeah. You want to use both because yeah. you want to keep on moving forward. Going in circle for some time is fine. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. But at some point, you want to be able to move forward. So Absolutely. you need both engines. Yes. I think this is a very strong point for us to get to the end. And I can start with the two points that I really that really affected me from what you said today. The first one is you cannot outperform your environment. Mm. Super powerful. So reflect on the environment that you're in. And this canoe analogy that you just came up with, like it's like you can't clap with one hand. No. It's the same thing. That's right. Logic, emotion. Yeah. Clap. Absolutely. <laughs> Bravo. I yeah. like it. I like it. Your turn. I like it. Um, well, there are a few, um, but one in particular is that feeling first mm -hmm. is okay. It's a default. It is a power. Like I know you quite well. Yeah. And people don't let it fool you. She feels first, but she uses logic very effectively. <laughs> she went after her doctorate. She got yeah. a PhD in educational leadership. She knows how to use logic to have an impact mm -hmm. and to make a difference in people's lives. And so both are important, like you mm -hmm. said, but feeling first is fine. Mm -hmm. For me, for years, I didn't think it was fine. I thought the only way was to think first. Mm -hmm. And uh, through meeting my wife, who's also a feeler, mm -hmm. uh, you are more of a feeler. Mm -hmm. And having discussions together, I see day in and day out that this is a superpower yes. to feel. And so my old philosophy of think first, feel never is not a good one. Mm -hmm. Don't try that at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also uh, when you said that, there are no bad parts. Mm. Uh, that to me hit home mm -hmm. because for a very long time, I saw all kinds of bad parts mm -hmm. in me growing up. And I thought that I had to get rid of them or shut them down or don't show them. Uh, but really when you have that mindset that there are no bad parts, it is so liberating. Mm -hmm. You learn to embrace all of you. And so I think that your self-acceptance, you learning that being sensitive or anything else is okay, has been very powerful in your life. And the people listening and watching us today could take that home, take it somewhere, make something with it mm -hmm. and transform the way they also feel about some of those parts that they might have thought were bad. Yeah. They're not. Yes, they're not bad. There no. are no bad parts. No. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope that it helped you. I know that it changed something inside of you. So reflect on it. See what changes you need to make in your life. Follow us on all social media platforms at In The Clear Podcast. And subscribe to the podcast on all platforms that you might listen to, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play. And we hope to see you next time. Send us feedback wherever you can. And until next time, have a great day.